Thanks very much, Paul. Oh, We're really delighted to have you here. Um, and uh, I really can't recommend the book enough. It's deeply discounted in the back, uh, a better deal than what I paid for it, in fact. <laughs> Um, so I hope you'll pick up copies on the way out. Um, I, I thought we'd start up uh, on a more personal note, if we could, um, which is that you were in the intelligence community for 30 years. For much of that time, you were working on this book. Um, mm. uh, and uh, I wonder if you could say a little bit about the ways in which um, your reflections on Kennan, not just about East Asia, but more generally on Kennan as an analyst, impacted the way that you thought about your own career in the intelligence community. Oh, that's an interesting question. The, uh, I mean, in terms of working on the book, uh, the funny thing is that uh, part of the problem was that I wasn't able to work on the book. I, uh, when, when I was, I'd been working here as an analyst for about five years before I talked to the office into giving me a bit of a sabbatical. Uh, I came to Washington with a master's degree uh, and in 1989. They gave me a year off to start my doctoral program here at George Washington. Uh, and I was able to complete that. Well, I took coursework for one year, then I went back to work. I completed the, the program and the writing of the dissertation while still working, while having returned to work full time. I don't know how I ever survived that. I guess I didn't with sanity. Uh, but I finished, the, I finished the, man, the dissertation in 1995. Uh, and it sat on my shelf because I was too busy uh, dealing with Richard as NIO and other things during that period <laughs> to, um, to, to pursue publication. And it was only after I retired uh, that I was able to put together. Uh, but in terms of, as an analyst, uh, it's interesting. People keep making comparisons between me and Kenan, and they say that the cover of the photo of the book makes, it looks like me. But uh, uh, I had become enamored of Kenan uh, and had really much kind of... Uh, adopted his realist perspective uh, when I was an undergraduate. Uh, I, w I was enamored of his writing style, and I think I, I used it, I think, partly as a model. Uh, but I think the, the kind of sim the simultaneity of my work on East Asia uh, and my research uh, into his work were kind of mutually reinforcing uh, in terms of a very, you know, realist uh, perspective uh, and uh, you know, a more sophisticated historical understanding. I mean, Kennan, as you know, was himself a historian. So I think that reinforced uh, my approach to, and actually a lot of the analysts, uh, some in the room here, will, will tell you that working with me uh, was sometimes challenging because I was always invoking history. <laughs> and I was, I was probably always making, often making comparisons to Kennan's approach to things and the region. So I guess if that... Well, one of the critiques um, of him in your book is that he would often generate proposals that were politically untenable, right? <laughs> so how did you think about that as an intelligence officer? Obviously, you were not in, not in mm -hmm. policy planning proposing initiatives, affirmative initiatives in the same way, but how did you think about that as an intelligence officer and whether analysis <laughs> you, were pro you were providing was out of sync with the politics of the day? Well, the interesting thing about, well, and it's kind of a prevailing issue today, uh, I mean, an intelligence analyst learns early on uh, that their job is not to engage in policy recommendations. So in a sense, uh, whether our analysis is politically palatable is, is not irrelevant, uh, but it, it's certainly the environment in which we, environment in which we, in which we operate. Uh, uh, I think the difference uh, in that respect, you know, Kennan was a policymaker, uh, so he was always making recommendations that were inattentive to you know, domestic political constituencies or other alliance relationships. Uh, as an intelligence analyst, we didn't make policy recommendations. We were kind of, uh, as I said, uh, uh, protected from, uh, from that accountability. Uh, uh, and in fact, it, it, was, it was always something gratifying when you know, delivering intelligence analysis to policymakers, uh, which whether it was politically viable or not, we knew that sometimes it didn't agree with their own analysis of the situation, uh, even in terms of foreign policy analysis. Uh, but you know, not to be not to be too cynical, but our view was, well, that's that's their problem. Uh, they they uh, will we, we assess the situation, we present our we send our, we presented our analysis to policymakers, uh, and whether they what a safe what what weight they assign to it, uh, and what. Um, whether they uh, 
made decisions that were attentive to some of the vulnerabilities or uh, either the risks or opportunities of policy that we would identify, at least implicitly, uh, was their call. Uh, and it was sometimes frustrating uh, when we thought some element of our analysis was being overlooked. Uh, but the upside was that we were not held, we, were, we, we did not see ourselves as accountable uh, for policy, make, make, or policy decisions uh, that might have run counter to analysis we'd provided. Uh, now, one of the other cynical views within the intelligence community is that all policy failures are blamed by policymakers on intelligence failures, uh, but we never wholly subscribe to that view. <laughs> Um, w one of the points you made toward the end of the presentation, and, and you repeatedly underscore in the book, is that Kennan was very conscious of the limits of U.S. influence um, in the region as a, as, a, as a major factor to, to consider. And um, uh, one question I had for you on that count was whether, in some ways, Kennan was unqualified to be making the judgments he was making about East Asia. Obviously, he relied on Davies. He relied on McMurray. But uh, as you point out in the book, he wrote when he was 94 years old that um, the reason he wrote little about China was that I, I, I knew and still know very little about it. Yes. Well, I mean, he, he would be the first. I mean, at the beginning of his career uh, and all the way through, he always uh, was, would be the first to admit that he had no experience with East Asia uh, and wasn't qualified uh, well, he, he wasn't a specialist or an expert there. Uh, but he did have a certain, obviously, a level of intellectual arrogance. He thought that his strategic analysis of the balance of power in the world and what was important and what wasn't uh, was still valid. Uh, I think that he overstepped uh, in several respects there. I mean, certainly in terms of his assessment of, uh, you know, the irony, one of the ironies is that given his inattention to political realities, uh, the fact that it was um, political distaste, really, that, that reinforced his dismissive attitude toward the strategic importance of China for so long uh, is really striking. Uh, so I, I think what, what I say in the book is that he was sometimes right when the Asia experts were wrong. Uh, but even when he was, it wasn't always at the right time or for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So since you brought it up, so, so his, obviously with his relationship with... Uh, China was complicated. His attitudes toward China were quite complicated. So, um, you know, if you you at one point say that he thought of the Chinese as the uh, French of Asia, which I take was a mixed mixed compliment uh, in some ways. But but you you know you're right that China he acknowledged China as the seat of a great culture, which deserves our highest respect. Um, uh, the Chinese is being extremely mature, intelligent, industrious resourceful people, uh, and indeed the most intelligent man for man of the world's people. And on the other hand, as you mentioned, there was this ethnocentrism and a selective memory that you thought clouded his judgments uh, in many ways. Um, uh, uh, was his response to that just to throw his arms up and say, I, I can't put all of this together? Um, well, uh, I, think, yeah. I, I think there what he was trying to do was make a distinction between China and the Chinese government. Or I, to make more precise, Chinese governments. Uh, I think you know, and in fact, even when he was complimentary uh, of Chinese civilization and culture, there was a certain kind of ethnocentric stereotype that he applied to it. Uh, in fact, it was the same toward Japan. Uh, I think early on he describes you know the the, the the virile people of Japan compared to the feckless people or whatever of China. Uh, but I mean, uh, he never fully succeeded in making that distinction uh, because, as I said, uh, even though he had respect for Chinese civilization, he was wholly dismissive of both the Chinese communist government and the Chinese nationalist government. Uh, and I think that was the basis for him throwing up his hands. Well, that and his simultaneous assessment that it was not going to be strategically consequential. Uh, that led to his persistent belief that we should just keep them at arm's length. I think one of the other quotes is we should be content to leave the mainland of Asia alone and to be left alone by it. Uh, and the fact that he was saying, I, th I think the last, uh, the last document I found in my research in which he commented on China uh, was a letter he wrote at the age of 97 to then Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld in 2001 <laughs> in which he said, among other things, I don't know why we can't get over our infatuation with China. They're not going to love us. 
But uh, even then, I mean, that was 20 years after Deng Xiaoping had started transforming the country into a highly consequential place. Right. Uh, but like me, Kennan was never an economist, so he didn't pay much attention to that. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about his relationship with George Marshall. So as you, as you mentioned the book, that was really the apex of his influence. Um, it diminished sharply under um, Acheson. Part of that was Acheson's bureaucratic style, but part of it was also just Marshall's trust in him. So w w tell us a little bit more about that relationship and why, why Marshall trusted him. Yeah. It's hard to think of two personalities that were more different than Marshall and Acheson. Um, uh, Marshall latched on to Kennan because, uh, as Richard mentioned, Kennan became famous in 1946 and 1947 uh, with the long telegram. In, in January 1946, uh, Ambassador Harriman was on leave in Washington, and Kennan was chargé at the embassy and received a cable saying, we need somebody out there to explain to us Soviet foreign policy. So he wrote this, I think, five or seven thousand page, ten part cable. Word. Sir? Who said page? Five oh, word, I'm sorry, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> to a lot of people it seemed that long. Uh, and explaining in exquisite, you know, detail through, you know, highly sophisticated, and I mean, he was a historian, he was a cultural uh, expert on China. It was just a brilliant tour de force. And uh, that, uh, that telegram, uh, started circulating in Washington, uh, thanks to uh, Secretary Forrestal uh, and other folks who were uh, trying to formulate. It, it was just, at the right time, a brilliant explanation of what the Soviets were coming, where they were coming from. And then a year later, it was kind of uh, repackaged as the X article, the sources of Soviet conduct, in which he outlined this doctrine of containment. Uh, and when, when Marshall became, by the time Marshall was appointed to be Secretary of State in January 1947, um, Kennan's name and his approach to the Soviet Union, which was seen as the, as I said, the overarching challenge of foreign, of U.S. foreign policy, uh, was was attributable to Kennan. So he said, "You're the smart guy," and and Marshall, being a you know a five to four star general, was it five? Uh, he was good at delegating responsibility. Uh, so he wanted to create a, a staff within the State Department that was comparable to the Plans and Operations Division at the Pentagon, and he. He handpicked Kennan to do it and said, here, you will make policy for me because you know how to do that and I don't. Uh, and it was really, as I said, because of that and the unique relationship, the unique access that Kennan had to Marshall, who he revered, as most people in Washington did at the time, uh, gave the policy papers that Kennan was producing uh, on all parts of the world uh, center stage in policy formulation. Uh, and it was a very symbiotic relationship that was largely a function of Marshall's recognition of Kennan's brilliance uh, and his ability to deploy Kennan's analysis in support of the policy formulation in the interagency. So let's talk a little bit about um, Korea. And you mentioned Kennan's complicated uh, views on U.S. credibility and reputation. Um, so Kennan went from calling the Korean Peninsula strategically expendable to then firmly advocating the commitment of U.S. forces, to then saying the U.S. should allow the gradual and not so conspicuous control of the Korean Peninsula by the Soviets. So how, how uh, explain this evolution? Well, I, f frankly, it was, it was the one thing, uh, and it was kind of mysterious in my correspondence with Kennan. Uh, the one thing that he faulted me for in the dissertation version of the book was that I didn't fully understand his position on Korea. Uh, but no one else did either. Uh, it, it, it seemed to fluctuate, and, uh, and I think it's because it, there was an inconsistency that he was not able to resolve himself. Uh, uh, and it, it comes back to the prestige issue. Like everybody, I'm not sure how you formulated the last part of the question, but uh, he, even though he, well, actually, yeah, he, he thought that uh, we needed to respond to what he saw as a Soviet initiative, uh, but by three months later, he was advocating uh, a withdrawal that would have allowed the Soviets in control uh, of the Korean Peninsula if this could be done in an inconspicuous way. Uh, but it, it just it didn't seem, I, I say in the book, I, I don't know how that was possible, how you could allow that to happen and not have it be noticed or not have it be seen uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a liability or a net... Uh, 
deficit in terms of our credibility and prestige. Did you have an opportunity to ask him what he meant by that? What, what that no, I didn't. Like? Okay. The, uh, I mean, I corresponded with him several times. I only met him on one occasion, but it was very briefly. Uh, I was never able to, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, his assertion that his position in Korea wasn't fully understood was, I, in, in my maybe self-serving view, it was a product of his own ambivalence, and I think the, uh, the, the inconsistency that I, I never saw resolved in his writing about it uh, then or later. Well, and in fact, uh, uh, there was another inconsistency. In the summer of 1950, uh, he thought it was a Soviet operation, but in some of his writings 10 years later, he said people in Washington were uh, underestimated uh, this as exclusively a Soviet operation. So I think you know, he certainly had a learning curve there too. But over the course of 1950, he went very quickly uh, from uh, this is not important, as you said, to we need to push back, to a couple months later, we need to get out of there. Uh, uh, on, 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 in, uh, you know, in the form of a totally politically and diplomatically unrealistic proposal. Uh, what he was proposing in, in that memo to, to Atchison in August of 1950, he said we should we should make an offer to the Soviets if they will get the North Korean troops back into into into. North Korea, we will withdraw from both South Korea and Japan. We will neutralize both of them if they will neutralize the South. Uh, I, I just don't think that was ever viable, and I don't know how he thought that. Uh, I mean, perhaps in strictly realist terms, it made a certain amount of logical sense, but politically and diplomatically, it, uh, it was not something that could have happened inconspicuously without, uh, without a net loss, yeah. really for us and our allies. Do you, th do you think his struggle with the credibility question resembles debates that we have today about the same issue um, with Russian provocations uh, of China? Uh, how, how do you see that, his own struggle refracted in today's debate? Well, I mean, I, I, I think about it a lot whenever I see the debate about uh, uh, the South China Sea. Uh, you know, Kennan's argument in the summer of 1950 was we cannot allow the Russians to uh, extend their influence and control over the Korean Peninsula in a way that's inimical to our credibility. And now we're having the debate about we can't allow the Chinese to extend their control over the South China Sea, which is in a, in a way that's inimical to our interest and our credibility among the other claimants uh, in that region. Uh, but there are logistical and resource constraints and legal uh, constraints on how uh, forward we can be in pushing back. So I, to me, it's a, it's a, it's a version in, in there in the, uh, of the same issue. Uh, and in fact, even in Korea today, uh, you know, I think the overarching issue in Korea is what the strategic orientation of the peninsula is going to be uh, in the 21st century. It's kind of, in my view, the swing vote in terms of the U.S.-China spheres of influence in the region. I think that underlies the entire approach we have to, to, uh, uh, to the Korean peninsula. Uh, and part of it is this desire uh, you know, 70 years ago was the, the desire to prevent Soviet influence over the Korean Peninsula at our experience. Now we want to prevent, uh, and reasonably so, uh, Chinese influence exclusive of ours on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, I think, uh, I think, uh, you know, I, I don't view it as exclusively or necessarily a zero-sum game, and I'm not sure Kennan did either. So the dreaded question, what would Kennan do about the South China Sea today? What do you, uh, the impossible question, uh, and Korea. We know more about his views on Korea as they evolved through his uh, academic writing and retirement, but you've mentioned Korea and the South China Sea. What would Kennan? Well, again, he was inconsistent here. As I said, uh, you know, in, uh, for most of his career, he would have, uh, in fact, in the 1970s, at the end of the Vietnam War, he said, finally, we're out of there. We can, we can, we can relegate that region to irrelevance again. Uh, again, that was one of the uh, ways you can fault him is his inattention to the strategic and economic potential of Southeast Asia, let alone the rest of the region. Uh, he was dismissive of uh, the strategic, I mean, he, he would certainly be dismissive of the strategic importance of the South China Sea and these inconsequential islands. Uh, uh, but as I said, uh, he did advocate elements of kind of pushing back against this immaterial extension of even Chinese influence at the time. 
So I, I think he might not be too, uh, diverge too much from our imperative now to prevent the Chinese from taking over the South China Sea. But I think, uh, I feel strongly he would, he would, and I agree with this, uh, I think he would advise against defining it as a military problem that required a military solution. Uh, I mean, that was his complaint against containment in that region and in Europe, that we turned it into a military strategy. And he was ambivalent early on, but he spent most of the latter part of his career denying that he intended containment as a military strategy. Uh, and I, I think he would have advocated, in fact did, uh, in a different uh, kind of set of circumstances, pushing back diplomatically in a way that would retain U.S. influence uh, and the credibility of the U.S. as a power broker and a guarantor of security in the region, uh, but not in a way that would turn it into a military containment strategy. And I think the same applies to the Korean Peninsula. There's a, a passage from a, the, his diary that you cite, and I, I want to I read it at length because um, it kind of struck a chord that I, I, I think with a number of analysts that I've talked to recently in, in which he says, Quote, plainly the government has moved into an area where there is a reluctance to recognize the finer distinctions of the psychology of our Soviet adversaries for the reason that movement in this sphere of speculation is all too undependable, too relative, and too subtle to be comfortable or tolerable to people who feel themselves confronted with the grim responsibility of recommending decisions which may mean war or peace. In such times, it is safer and easier to cease the attempt to analyze the probabilities involved in your enemy's mental processes or calculate his weaknesses. It seems safer to give him the benefit of every doubt in matters of strength and to credit him indiscriminately with all aggressive designs, even when some of them are mutually contradictory. In these circumstances, I was inclined to wonder whether the day had not passed when the government had use for the qualities of persons like ourselves. <laughs> So um, I read that, and then, and then I thought about uh, a piece you wrote for the Assan Forum about oh. US, <laughs> US China relations. And maybe I'm uh, reading, reading too much uh, into it. <laughs> um, I don't think you are. <laughs> um, but but um, yeah, say a little bit. I mean, uh, that, that, that is a sentiment that I think a lot of intelligence analysts probably feel uh, at, a, at a particular moment. Um, uh, uh, I, I'm not reading too much into it, you're saying. <laughs> no, well, I mean, I, you know, what Kennan was complaining, this was in 1950, I think, right? He was complaining against uh, the policy communities. Uh, I think I mentioned, I alluded to it earlier, uh, resistance to a sophisticated and subtle explanation of Soviet foreign policy uh, uh, as something other than a winner-take-all, you know, zero-sum contest. Uh, and just a few months ago, I, was, I stumbled across again some things that he wrote in the 1970s in one of his books, The Cloud of Danger, 1977, in which at that time he detected a very hardening of attitudes toward the Soviet Union, uh, which he thought was highly problematic and dangerous because it was this kind of stereotypical, one-dimensional uh, Soviet threat uh, and you know, policy and politics was kind of converging around that uh, that characterization of the Soviet Union, uh, I feel strongly that the same thing is happening today with regard to China. Uh, and again, partly as an analyst and as an intelligence officer, I think the prevailing characterization of the threat that China poses to the United States is almost unidimensional. Uh, it's, it's stereotypical. Uh, it, it's much more zero-sum and existential than I think as an analyst is accurate. Uh, so I think there's very much a resonant echo to that. Uh, his so, view of the Soviet Union, I think, is, is, is echoed in the, uh, I, I think, disturbing trend, the, the direction of the way that the policy community is thinking about, and the, a lot of the media is characterizing China. I mean, as I say in the Asan article, China poses an unprecedented and huge uh, historical challenge to us. Uh, uh, that's gonna be, it, it's, I think, more consequential than the Soviet Union did uh, and is going to be harder to deal with, but it's of a very different nature, uh, and I think that's not uh, sufficiently understood. I'm going to channel my inner Kagan in a minute to put you <laughs> on the piece, but but before that, I mean, how would you describe the debate uh, within the China watching community today? How would you describe the camps and kind of what the what is the what are the core areas of disagreement right now that you see? 
depends on how broadly you define the China watching community. Here in the United uh, States, yeah. Well, I mean, there's debate even within the intelligence community, frankly. Uh, uh, you know, I, I often come back to uh, the debate over whether China is pursuing a zero-sum winner-take-all, I guess I mentioned that earlier, uh, strategy toward the United States. Uh, I, I think the debate focuses on, you know, what is the breadth and scope of China's uh, strategy and its ambitions. Uh, I mean, if you read the national security strategy, uh, I think that that has embraced uh, a characterization which is toward, you know, one end of the spectrum. Uh, it describes China as a revisionist power that is trying to, I can't remember the phrase, I think I have it in the Asan article, uh, seeks to frame a world inimical to U.S. values and interests uh, and... Seeks veto authority over other nations, economic diplomatic security. Yeah, I think there's some other, uh, uh, well, and wants to supplant the United States and achieve global preeminence. Uh, I think that's one end of the policy debate. In fact, well, it's not the far end because there are, uh, there are even more uh, extremist views, I think, that China is trying to communize the world uh, and wants to eliminate U.S. power. Uh, in fact, there was something, uh, well, there's just, endless commentaries today which have a really absolutist uh, exclusive of U.S. interests and values uh, view of China's uh, goals and its strategies. Uh, I think the other end of the debate, uh, well, depending on I mean, there's different flavors or characterizations, uh, is a view that China is not necessarily pursuing a zero-sum a winner to, it doesn't want to supplant the United States as the global hegemon because it recognizes that this is neither achievable nor necessary to guarantee China's security, uh, that China uh, is trying to legitimize uh, its political and economic system internationally, uh, not export it uh, and get the rest of the world to subscribe to it in totality, that China is uh, prepared for some version of peaceful coexistence with the United States uh, rather than, uh, you know, an exclusive uh, role in the region. Uh, that China is certainly, even, even, I think even people at this end of the debate acknowledge, and I say in the Asan article, China is relentlessly and ruthlessly competitive, uh, and sometimes it's going to play by the rules, but I frankly think it's enough of a problem when it or isn't going to play by the rules. I think it's enough of a challenge when it does play by the rules because it has a lot more to bring to the, to the international rivalry than the Soviet Union did. Uh, but I, I think the debate centers on how absolutist or exclusive China's goals are uh, uh, and the extent to which China is trying to remake the world in its image. Uh, because I'm on the end of the debate which suggests that China is trying to certainly maximize its influence and its footprint in the world. It's trying to maximize the extent to which it is one of the rule makers uh, and it's going to seize every opportunity, particularly in the non-military realms, uh, to extend that influence. Uh, but it's not trying to forge a world inimical to U.S. values and interests uh, and, as I said, remake the world in its image. I think that's where I would characterize the two kind of, I'm simplifying, poles in the debate. So you, you do say that efforts, uh, quote, efforts to sustain an unsustainable or ahistorical role um, in East Asia would probably be counterproductive and fuel regional tensions, by which I interpret you'd be saying the era of American primacy in East Asia is essentially coming to an end, and we should yield to Chinese primacy in East Asia. Maybe I'm, if I'm misinterpreting, you tell me, but, but if that's the case, uh, how stable do you think that arrangement will be? Well, the question is how to forge something that is stable, and it's a really tough call. I mean, I think uh, you're extrapolating a bit. I mean, I, you know, as a historian, you know, my view is, and I think this is consistent with the way Kennan thought about our role in East Asia at the time, you know, and again, maybe I'm fooling myself in hindsight, but I think what Kennan recognized during his tenure at the policy planning staff was that the role that the U.S. secured in the region in 1945 was a historical anomaly uh, that, you know, the, the, the sustainability of which uh, and the permanence of which was, was eventually going to go away. Uh, uh, and I think that, uh, you know, unfortunately, since that time, we have kind of internalized uh, an assessment that U.S. primacy in the region uh, is 
is a vital interest, and retaining it is a vital interest, and that is the only way to secure uh, U.S. interests against China's efforts to deny us that. Uh, my view is that uh, that mindset is flawed in two respects. Uh, I don't think that U.S. primacy, uh, well, first of all, I don't believe that China is trying to extrude the United States from a strategic role in East Asia. Uh, again, I mentioned that, you know, I think they're, 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 they're receptive to some version of, you know, peaceful coexistence or overlapping spheres of influence, however you even want to define it, rather than an, an, an exclusive or absolutist view. Uh, and the question you asked is, you know, how do we, how could we formulate that? I know that uh, Michael Swain and others have written on this idea of this challenge of building a stable balance of power between the United States and China and the Western Pacific. Uh, but again, my view is that the idea that retaining U.S. primacy is the only way we can secure our interests against the Chinese challenge, I think mischaracterizes the nature of the Chinese challenge as an absolutist and an inclusive one. And it also uh, uh, overestimates the extent to which a primacy is sustainable or whether it's vitally necessary. Uh, I, I think that uh, uh, we need to recognize that primacy is probably not sustainably in material uh, terms, and we have to find some way of defining our interests in a way that don't oblige us to pursue uh, what Kennan would call a containment strategy. I think the other thing that's overlooked is that uh, in, in our deliberations on how to rationalize a definition of our interest and what's vital and what isn't and how to pursue it, I think we often are inattentive to the views not just of the Chinese, uh, but of all the other countries in the region, uh, including, and in fact, I think especially our allies, uh, who I think understand better than we have for the last 70 years that our role in their region uh, was kind of historically an accident and was not always going to be there. Uh, I think for our own reasons in terms of resource constraints and frankly our own political polarization and dysfunctionality at this point, uh, it's, it's hard for me to see how we could sustain it even if we attempted to. Uh, but the thing we need to be attentive to, in my view, and this is where I think Kennan would have, would have agreed with me, uh, the uncertainties and, frankly, the doubts uh, that our allies and friends in the region have about our attention span, uh, about the sustainability of our interests, because uh, I think they already are, have mixed concerns about, about that and are already recalibrating their approach to each other and to the Chinese uh, in ways which are further ahead in accommodating history than I think some of the voices in Washington are. One uh, final question, then we'll open up to the floor. There's a tremendous amount of expertise here in the audience. So it's uh, on Russia-China relations. So as you mentioned, can consider it one of the great victories of containment to split the Russians and Chinese. As you look now at President Xi and President Putin cooking blini together and <laughs> participating in war games and meeting almost on a monthly basis, engaging in pretty big uh, technology cooperation deals and so on. Do you think it's more of the same? There's, there are hard limits to cooperation uh, and that longstanding theory in the U.S. government still holds or should we be generating some kind of more falsifiable uh, hypotheses about what kind of cooperation would indicate uh, a, new, a, new, uh, a new relationship between the two governments? Well, I, I, I'm one of the people who thinks there will always be hard limits there. I mean, I, I think that that's an evolving relationship, uh, and I think it certainly uh, poses an additional strategic challenge to the United States uh, for reasons which we've seen for the last 20 years. I mean, they have a strategic partnership. They cooperate. I mean, they have some shared interests that are uh, contrary to the United States. Well either U.S. interest or the U.S. role in the world. I mean, they've, they've taken turns uh, vetoing U.N. Security Council resolutions. Uh, they've got uh, arms control. Uh, they, they've both been committed to what they call the democratization of international relations and a kind of diminution of the hegemony of the United States. Uh, and I think there are additional areas where their relationship is especially problematic. I think their military exercises are less of a... I mean, it's easy to, you know, highlight them, but I, I can't see the Chinese and the Russians uh, actually fighting us jointly anywhere. Uh, I don't know where that would be. Uh, I, I think the challenge is more uh, in multilateral fora and on issues like cyber, uh, where they have a very different view of Internet uh, 
governance mm -hmm. and sovereignty than we do. Uh, and certainly, I mean, they're obviously a, a threat, uh, a challenge in terms of their influence operations and their intelligence operations. I mean, and they're both, as I said, both relentless and ruthless in pursuit of their interests. Uh, so, I mean, t in my mind, the balance sheet is that it's a relationship which is uh, something we need to contend with and need to, to find ways to push back against. On the other side of the balance sheet, I think it's easy to exaggerate uh, it for a couple of reasons. One, if you look at the primary strategic problems we confront in dealing with the Chinese, uh, most of them are not the same areas where we're confronting the Russians. Uh, I mean, China, I mean, certainly an international forum, but, you know, our, our primary problems with China are within East Asia. Uh, their sovereignty issues, their throwing their weight around, their coercive behavior, I mean, again, that extends globally as well. Uh, whereas the Russians are a problem for us in Eastern Europe still and in the Middle East. Uh, and interestingly, I think this is where uh, the Chinese don't want to get involved in the areas where Russia is a problem for us and Russia isn't really involved in the areas where China is a problem for us. And in fact, China doesn't want them to be. I think it's important that the Chinese don't want Russia to be a player in the Western Pacific. The other thing is I think that relationship has evolved a lot over the last decade uh, because of its internal imbalance. I mean, 20 years ago, when as an analyst, I was you know, first drawn into assessment of the China-Russia relationship, they were both of kind of comparable strategic importance. They're not anymore. China is very much the rising power. Russia is a declining power. It is a, it's the junior partner in the relationship. It needs China more than China needs it. And I think that is, in addition to the historical resentment and, and uh, suspicions they've had against each other, uh, I think that's one of the constraints on how that relationship is going to develop. And in fact, I was at another seminar a couple of days ago, and uh, I think the Belt and Road Initiative is another potential fault line there. Uh, certainly, you know, Xi and Putin have collaborated on this, and there are certainly economic opportunities for the Russians in this thing. Uh, but I can't, as a historian, avoid seeing the great game. I mean, there is a latent contest for influence in Central Asia between China and Russia, which has been percolating, uh, you know, on the back burner for the last 20 years. And I think the Belt and Road Initiative is only going to advance China's influence in what was China's sphere of influence, I'm sorry, Russia's, for 100 years. So I think there's limits there. We can continue this for, 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 uh, for the <laughs> session, but uh, the, the floor is open now, please, at the, at the back. <clears throat> Victor B. from Global Peace Foundation. Um, I have a question regarding Korean uh, Peninsula. Uh, in your view, what will be the ideal situation for the United States? Whether what will be the uh, Korea, it? the whether, ideal situation. Oh, ideal. Yeah, whether whether a unified Korea under the uh, idea of uh, freedom, democracy, and rule of law, and those kind of uh, scenario, a desirable uh, and feasible situation. Uh, if so, how can this happen? Well, I mean, I, I think you know. Uh, I mean, the textbook answer is that the ideal situation for the United States would be a unified peninsula under the auspices of the government in Seoul, which retains a U.S. alliance, uh, with alliance with the United States, and, and, uh, and really leaves the United States more influential on peninsula than China does. Uh, and I guess that's conceivable, uh, but I, you know, I think the Chinese are always going to anticipate and expect and, in fact, demand uh, more influence, uh, at least some influence, uh, not to be excluded. And I think the Chinese, and again, I, there are Korea specialists here who can talk about this more authoritatively than me, but I think the Chinese believe, with some reason, that for geographic and historical reasons, uh, the Koreans themselves uh, do not see it as feasible to, a, to attempt to exclude Chinese influence there. Uh, Particularly because I think the, even the South Koreans, frankly, I think, have long been ambivalent about the U.S. relationship and our attention. Uh, I mean, this has been reinforced off and on for several years. Uh, I th and, and I mentioned in my talk, or I guess earlier, that I see uh, the Korean Peninsula as kind of the, the swing vote in terms of the strategic orientation of the region. Uh, 
you know, the ideal solution, obviously, for the Chinese uh, is a unified peninsula that's under their sphere of influence and not ours. Uh, and I, I, would, I would say that it's not necessarily the case that that would be under the auspices of the government in Pyongyang. Uh, I, I know I'm kind of an outlier here, but I think the Chinese, uh, I don't subscribe to the idea that the Chinese are retaining North Korea as a buffer state because a buffer state is supposed to protect you from something, and I don't know what North Korea has protected China from for a long time now. Uh, I think the Chinese have every reason to have reached the conclusion, if they haven't already, that the, their relationship with North Korea or the existence of North Korea is a net strategic liability for them. And it's one of the reasons they've been investing, or until recently, had been investing heavily in their relationship with South Korea. Uh, now, for self-destructive reasons, the Chinese squandered a lot of that uh, over the last couple of years in their response to the THAAD deployments and all. Uh, but I think a unified peninsula under the auspices of the government in Seoul uh, could be an ideal solution for the Chinese uh, because it's a more reliable government. Uh, and, you know, the, the only reason the Chinese don't actively pursue that is because they have no confidence, nor can they, in their ability to control the process by which this comes about. Uh, you know, I, I think the ideal solution for both sides is a unified, frankly, uh, a unified government for both the Chinese and the United States is a unified peninsula, uh, frankly, under the auspices of the government in Seoul, which is pragmatic enough uh, to have progressive, constructive relations with both Beijing and Washington and Japan. Uh, and I think that a lot of the diplomacy uh, of the last decade uh, has been kind of reconnoitering around uh, whether such a thing is possible. Uh, I'm not optimistic. Uh, I mean, you know, there's a lot of a lot of things up in the air now because, and in fact, the one thing I would, I guess I'll end with this. I mean, I think that we're, a lot of the commentary of, of what's been happening this year, I think is somewhat inattentive to the importance of the North-South relationship. I mean, Moon is in Pyongyang as we speak, uh, forging a relationship or pursuing a relationship, which I think on both sides is intended to marginalize the extent to which either Beijing or Washington dictates the future of the peninsula. Yeah. Uh, and, I, you know, I, because I think that the moon is ambivalent. The South Koreans have always been ambivalent about Washington, and I can promise you the North Koreans have always been ambivalent about P Beijing. Uh, so I, I think that they're kind of the drivers now of what's happening. Uh, and again, we're cultivating our relationship with Moon and with Kim. Uh, she is doing the same. Uh, but I think the real... Uh, the most important variable actors right now are the two leaders on the peninsula. We had a question in the third row here. Maybe the two of you to, uh, take one, two of you together, and then we'll, we'll take them at once. Yeah. Uh, hello. Thank you for your talk. My name is Evan Sankey. I'm uh, I work at Johns Hopkins Sice. I, th I think uh, I think you're too harsh on George Kennan with regard to China, oh. and I'd like to mount a brief defense. Okay. Uh, China was never one of George Kennan's five industrial centers, oh, no. uh, especially when he was writing. You know, it was agrarian. It was racked by civil war. Um, it, it, it made sense from that perspective never to, to privilege China in the way that he privileged Japan. Uh, he did recognize the potential early on for uh, the Sino-Soviet split. And, uh, you gave him credit for that. I'm, I'm glad that you did. The, the third thing is that one of the key pillars of Kennan's thought in Asia, but also in Europe, was that the core competency of the United States was maritime. He saw the U.S.-Soviet conflict not just as an ideological thing or a matter of psychological resilience. It was also a matter of U.S. maritime power facing Soviet land power. And he did not see the United States as, a, as having the competencies or the capabilities to be a land power in Eurasia. That's why he discounted China. That's why he discounted Korea. He may have changed his mind a little bit. But I think that explains this blind spot. Thank you. <laughs> 
and we'll take this question as well. Thank you. Uh, my question is a little bit related. When the Beijing government, when, when Mao took control in 49, I think we continued somewhere in around 50, we, we continued to recognize the government in Taiwan as a legitimate government of all of China. We until, did until 1979. <laughs> what was Kennan's view on the wisdom of that policy? Secondly, I just want to make a comment. I don't think you appreciate the impact of the imbalance in our trade and technology and investment relationship with China and the importance of that in helping them increase their comprehensive national power and create political problems in the United States because of the impact on our own economy and our own workers. Thank you. Uh, well, I have, to, I have to remember the sequence here. Uh, Evan, I, I, I'm not sure. I don't think I disagree with anything you said. If I, if I included China under uh, the five power centers that, that uh, Ken and, uh, said, I, I, I misspoke. I meant Japan. Okay. <laughs> I was trying to give a, a greater rationalization for this blind spot. Well, I mean, the blind spot, I, I, I think it was accurate at the time. The blind spot was 50 years later when he still was dismissing China as strategically important. Uh, and I think that was, was uh, because his, his, his perspective on its importance was kind of clouded by, really, as I said, the contemptuous attitude he had both toward uh, the nationalist government uh, and frankly, the China lobby in the United States, which was driving policy in a, in a direction that he thought was uh, insignificant. Uh, I, I, you know, I don't disagree with your point about him seeing the United States as a maritime power, uh, but I don't think his vision was confined to that because, I mean, Kennan's view, uh, the centerpiece of containment was the Marshall Plan, uh, which was very much a continental strategy. Uh, and his, his approach to China, or to Japan, was, as I said in my talk, kind of a counterpart to that. It was we need to build up uh, a place that's politically and economically vulnerable to Chinese influence. Uh, I think he would have agreed with you uh, because it's, I think it's consistent with, uh, with the notion that uh, he didn't want containment to be a military strategy. Let's not think in terms of competing against the Russians militarily on the Eurasian landmass because that's, that's a losing proposition. He would, he would have agreed to that. On your point, sir, what, I'm sure the first point you made was... What was his view on recognizing the Beijing government as a legitimate government of oh. China during that whole period when we did... Yeah, well, I think there's a brief section in the book where I, uh, where I say that he, he, he saw no reason not to. He not thought to not to recognize them, well, particularly because he didn't... Uh, he thought it was irrational to assume that the nationalist government on Taiwan was the government of all of China. It had lost the Civil War, had no authority over the mainland that it could exercise. Uh, and again, as I said, he, uh, he had no regard for that government at all. Uh, uh, he had no regard for the, for the, for the Chinese Communist government, uh, but in the deliberations in 1949 and 1950, he said, yeah, recognize them, let them into the UN. He thought it didn't make a difference. Uh, and that we could only antagonize the Chinese and other countries in the region and in Europe, frankly, that were more, I mean, the British, I think, recognized the Chinese Communist regime in, in 1950, early on. Yes, they did. And he didn't see any reason why we, you know, even though he didn't think we needed to have anything to do with them, he, he thought that it was, it, was a, it was a petty thing uh, to deny them diplomatic recognition. Was that from Atchison that, that chose to do that? I think Atchison and Dulles. Uh, Dulles was very consequential uh, at that time. He had been brought into the administration, uh, even though he was Republican, because they were trying to respond to the Who Lost Asia debate. Uh, and he lost out to that. There's an interesting little anecdote in the, in the book where uh, it was during that period that Kennan heard secondhand that Dulles had described him as a very dangerous man uh, because he was advocating, uh, he was in indifferent about recognizing China. And then the last point you made about uh, about uh, the economic imbalance in our whole relationship with China. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I'm not an economist, nor was Kennan, uh, and uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, the the economic consequence of China and its impact with the trading relationship here is profound. Uh, but I think uh, the economists, you know, all of the economists that I deal with think that 
frankly, the current way that the administration is dealing with it will not work and will probably be kind of productive in terms of creating a more adversary relationship uh, than, than we need. Uh, you know, I, I think the challenge from China is primarily an economic one uh, and not primarily a military one, but you know, I think what we need to do to respond to it is to just get our act together and step up to the plate and compete. And right now we're not doing that. I mean, if you look at the Belt and Road Initiative and all these other places where we're complaining about the Chinese making inroads against us, uh, these host countries are not seeing a viable alternative that we're bringing to the table. Uh, and I think that's where the challenge from China needs to be confronted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the lady in the back. Hi, um, thank you. I'm an undergraduate student from the George Washington University. And um, my question is, what do you think are the <clears throat> first principles for students learning, um, studying foreign policy? Or what do you think are um, key questions when um, students are reading the historical narratives and analysis in foreign policy, and especially US foreign policy? Thank you. Oh my. <laughs> first principles of students? Well, I mean, as a historian, I would, first thing I would say is read a lot of history. I mean. Uh, well, I mean, I've taught at George Washington as well, and I've, you know, in the Elliott School, and, uh, and again, I was at the University of Iowa, one of my other alma maters, just last week and got the same question. If we want to pursue a career in international relations, what do we do? Uh, and I'll, I'll say the same thing. I mean, I, you know, I'm just a firm believer in the importance of history uh, in understanding contemporary international relations. Uh, I mean, I think that goes without saying. Uh, but the other thing, I mean, I always say to students is uh, this is a field where writing is of central importance. Uh, you know, I, I, if maybe I'm old fashioned. I, you know, I, I get the sense that undergraduates in particular and even graduate students, no, maybe not so graduate students, aren't required to do as much writing, certainly as I, my generation did. Uh, but Written analysis uh, is the most important vehicle for uh, con contributing to foreign policy debates. Uh, and I, you know, I, I was just a liberal arts student, uh, and I became a lifelong uh, advocate of that. I think research and analytical writing skills, uh, certainly that's what we, in the intelligence community, that was our bread and butter. Uh, so my advice is just, Read as much as you can, especially history and political science, and write as much as you can, uh, because that's what uh, creates the skills that you need to succeed, uh, either in the intelligence community or in the policy realm, or in anywhere, in the think camp community or in the, in the broader foreign policy debate. Uh, you have to be a concise, articulate writer who's well informed by history. Uh, final question to the gentleman here against the wall. I'm Haikas from Armenian National Committee, a PhD from China. Uh, so I know that uh, containment strategy is mainly about foreign policy, but American society had to pay high cost for containment strategy against the Soviet Union. So my question is about, is American society ready again to pay high cost for any type of possible containment strategy against China, especially now when China is top trade partner of U.S. allies, unlike Soviet Union. Is uh, any kind of possible containment strategy uh, realistic for, uh, for USA if the f American government find it necessary? Thank you for yeah. a chance. Could we, could we I guess your question is, could a, could a containment strategy work? Are we prepared for it? Or you don't have the answer. Are we willing to pay for it? Yeah. 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 The, uh, well, I, I think my answer and Kennan's answer would be, would be probably not. Uh, I mean, I think there's two parts to the question. I mean, if you're talking about a containment strategy toward the Soviet, toward Russia today, or or toward China. Yeah, I, I you know, I think for the reasons which I outlined, I don't think that. Uh, that uh, oh, where do I? Sorry, just one second here. 
there was one other quote from Kenan, which I think is immediately applicable to your question. Uh, I don't see it here, but uh, um, I think Kenan would have recognized, in fact, Kenan did recognize and would today uh, that a containment strategy toward China simply could not work because China doesn't have the attributes and the capabilities or, frankly, the goals and strategies that the Soviet Union did. Uh, and in, in fact, when policymakers in Washington say, of course we're not trying to contain China, it couldn't work because it's not the Soviet Union. It's, it's, the Soviet Union was an insular country that was not an economic powerhouse and was not uh, controlling areas that were strategically vital to us. The Chinese are at risk of doing so. Uh, they're, in, uh, they're, they're integrated into the, in, in the global community. Uh, I also think that the, uh, unlike the Soviet Union, if, if you read the way Cannon characterized the Soviet challenge in the X article, it was very much a, uh, from the Soviet perspective, we need to destroy capitalism. Uh, and there is no potential for peaceful coexistence uh, with the West. Uh, my own view was that China has never subscribed wholly to that. Uh, I mean, socialism with Chinese characteristics is essentially capitalism. So there's, it's not like they believe that there's something incompatible between the two. Uh, well, as much capitalism, it is central planning. Uh, but it's also, China is, I think, and this is where I diverge from some of the prevailing debate. I don't think China is trying to export its system and transform the world in its image. Uh, I think it's trying to maximize its influence and certainly adherence to that model because it gives credibility to the model back home where they're primarily focused on selling it to their own domestic audience. Uh, but I think, you know, back to the central element of your question as to whether, I mean, aside from the fact that the containment wouldn't work against China, uh, I think we are, frankly, problematic in our capacity to pursue it. Uh, and this is my closing thought. I mean, in, in the, one of the things that Kennan said in the X article was that in 1947, the U.S.-China contest is... Uh, the issue of Soviet-American relations is, in essence, a test of the overall worth of the United States as a nation among nations. And I don't have it here, but he goes on to say that, you know, at that time, the United States needed to demonstrate, frankly, to the rest of the world, and I'm not quoting exactly because I can't remember, but he said that it knows what it wants uh, and has its act together uh, and is assiduous in its pursuit of what it wants. Uh, and I frankly think all of those questions are subject to debate right now. Uh, as, as, a, as a former government official, uh, I think it's very much unclear uh, if we know what we want uh, and how best to pursue it and if we have the capacity to pursue it because of, you know, our domestic uh, political situation right now and the, frankly, the credibility, I think, that we're in, that we are endangering our credibility in the rest of the world and our, and our reputation as a nation among nations. Well, on that note, stay tuned for many more events on that question and the scope of China's ambition. And please join me in thanking Paul and congratulating him on your book. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.